Plant City Holdout, a familiar spot on this channel, and for many area rail fans who know and love the city that it stands in. Welcome back everyone to Home Rails. After quite the trip to Birmingham a couple weeks prior, I hadn't paid much attention to what was running in Central Florida until this day, Saturday, March 23rd, 2024, when around 5 p.m. I'd find myself out along the A-Line in Plant City to meet with a couple friends and see what would come our way. Knowing that tonight's IO44 would have one of CSX's heritage units leading the way, we'd start around Plant City but work our way to Lakeland for better light. On the way, I'd stumble upon M453, who had come down the S-Line earlier in the day, now taking the Yeoman sub to enter Winston Yard to the east, utilizing the Plant City connection which connects the S-Line to the A-Line. Two common GEs would be in charge of 453, who has a solid train today for Winston and Miami, getting access to Winston on the single-tracked Lakeland sub as soon as Amtrak PO92 was by. We'd follow the train into Lakeland, setting up at Wiggins Road about halfway there from Plant City. Since 453 can only start to speed up from 10 miles an hour after his entire train is clear of the connection track, we'd have close to a 10-minute wait as 453 notched up now only three miles out from his crew's termination point today. Thirty minutes behind the 453 would be PO92, coming out of Tampa on his way to New York, running on time today, seen here rolling past Lakeland Junction on the A-Line. This is Lakeland Junction, where the Vita sub coming off the S-Line joins the A-Line, with tracks for both north and southbound traffic here, creating a large mainline Y. Local L762 uses the junction as a Y almost every weekday, but most of the time, it's just the turning point for a plethora of mainline trains, including the IO44, which is why we're here in the first place. Leaving Tampa just before 6 p.m., the dispatcher would line a freight train ahead of 44 here in Lakeland, symboled X452, the X denoting an extra move. As far as I know, today's regular M452 was already close to Baldwin by this time, so an extra train was created to handle the freight train left in the siding at Stokes. Stokes is the only siding on the Vita sub between 10th Street and Lumberton, and apparently the only place a Winston-based crew was able to tie down a freight train and keep the main line clear. Now it was time to move that train north to presumably Baldwin or Waycross, which is why tonight's X452 is just a light engine move by us on their way to pick up their train in Stokes. Four fifty two wouldn't take long to get to Stokes and in the siding, which would improve the southbound track one signal here at the junction, telling us we'd have another train on the way set to meet the forty four right here on this short stretch of double track. Eighteen thirty two and the main event has arrived. IO44 with CSX's Chesapeake and Ohio Heritage Unit leading solo. The locomotive had been in the intermodal pool for about a week at this point, and I'm glad to say it stayed on long enough for us to see it. Formed in 1869, the Chesapeake and Ohio, or CNO for short, was a Class I railroad created by an amalgamation of a handful of smaller railroads in Virginia. In the beginning, its main traffic source was coal out of mines in both Virginia and Kentucky, 
but by its end in 1987, its system reached north into Michigan, covering Ohio, West Virginia, and even some parts of Indiana. Dissolved in 1987 by the official creation of CSX Transportation, almost all of CNO's 5,067 miles of main line are still used today and are vital freight routes for CSX, maintaining quite the competition with NS in the region. While not the cleanest heritage unit I've shot recently, it would still look quite good, coated in the perfect afternoon light here at the junction. 44 slow speed would soon turn into a halt at 10th Street as that approach signal was still lit for a southbound that was now clearing Vitus. We drive around the corner to Lakeland Junction closer to downtown as we heard L773 on the radio, departing Winston with auto racks for Palm Center just outside West Palm Beach. This is a daily local out of Winston that takes loaded auto racks from M453 and brings back empties that end up on M452 northbound. On some days, it also has freight for Okeechobee and Sebring, but because of the amount of traffic those towns receive, each have their own respective local, L-785 for Okeechobee and L-764 for Sebring. Approach medium. Proceed, approaching the next signal not exceeding medium speed, or 30 miles an hour. This indication would be for CO40, southbound coal for Orlando Stanton Energy Center out of Oaktown, Indiana. This train would be responsible for holding the higher priority IO44 at 10th Street for over 30 minutes, which would work out for us as the train rounded the banked curve here right at golden hour. Hey, look here, Mark, I'm thinking, uh, coal train. I appreciate it, guys. Y'all have a good rest of your day. Over. This would be my last catch of the night, but by far my favorite. These Orlando coal trains are the last of their kind in Central Florida, save for the rare Tampa coal moves bound for Big Bend in Apollo Beach. The lash up, while nothing special, is a bit uncommon, as these trains usually run with distributed power motor setups, this one being all head end, something much more appealing to me. The very next day, a text from a friend would lead me out to the Brooksville sub on a Sunday, a day that the subdivision's thrice weekly local usually runs on, today however at an uncommon time. It's just before noon now and we're in Lutz as L781 has just completed switching his only customer today, that being one center beam for Tibbetts Lumber in Lando Lakes. He's now returning engines light with a solo Jeep 40-3. I never thought I'd say this, but seeing a Jeep is a welcome sight now, considering that ever since March of last year, CSX's biodiesel CM44s have completely taken over the local. We'd catch up to the train again and get ahead at Skipper Road, a daylight shot I've been wanting to shoot for a while, notable for its 8-inch crossing gauge lights and old SEL no left turn crossing warning device. A few decades ago, the Seaboard maintained a small house track here with a parallel road for the occasional roadside offloading that was needed on this line. We're now standing on where that road once was, 
which has been gone for many years, but the crossing guard for it, similar to that of Mulberry and Palmetto, still remains. Two nights later on Tuesday, I'd hear 781 leaving Tampa back to its normal power of a CM44 duo. Except this day, it'd be about 6.45 p.m. when the train would depart, making for a twilight run through Lutz, something not terribly common before the summer and its later sunsets. Pulling in and setting up at 4th Avenue in Lutz, I'd park next to the Whistle Stop Tea Room, a quaint little attraction here in town that hosts an antique store, garden and courtyard, and of course, a tea room. It's been years since I've been, but it's nice to see that it's still here, looking well used but maintained. 1957, and in the last light of day, L781 rolls north, notching up to the newly raised 30 mile per hour track speed through here. Two weeks later, I'd have a Saturday morning empty, so my dad and I would head down to Tampa to see what we could find. With the exception of a few daily yard switchers and port jobs, Saturdays in Tampa can be fairly quiet due to the lack of locals running. Today would be no different, but hearing R643 on the radio, we'd pull into the south end of Yeoman. The crew would be dropping off a CM44 and SD40 duo on one of the many yard storage tracks, presumably to be added to tonight's M442's power set. They'd park the locomotives and tie them down, then climb onto the lead UP engine of an ethanol train that's been here in Yeoman for a couple of days now. Seeing this, we'd soon figure out that this R643, the symbol used for port shuttle traffic, would this morning be taking this 100-car UP-powered ethanol train down to Port Tampa for unloading, something I've actually never documented in my years of rail fanning down here. So we'd leave with the 643, beating the train down the hill to 34th Street, the last crossing before the tracks to the port split off from the old seaboard main that eventually becomes the Clearwater Sub, right around the corner at TN Interlocking. Now squarely in port trackage, we'd catch the train again at Grant Road, a spot I've seen a couple of folks photograph yard jobs at, but never an ethanol train, much less with foreign power. The small bridge overhead is a gas pipeline that connects massive fuel tanks on either side of the tracks, which ironically will soon be transporting the very ethanol that's rolling through underneath them. Tampa is not accessible to the public, so here at Hemlock Street is as far as we could go. 
Even from here though, one can see the entrance to CSX's yard here and a bunch of spurs that break out of the main loop track. CSX serves a dozen or more customers, some receiving a handful of cars a week and some a dozen a day, hence the three daily yard jobs that originate in Yeoman and serve the port. About an hour at the port, an R643 would now be returning to Yeoman, engines light, as apparently there wouldn't be any empties to bring back. Back in Yeoman now with R643, I'd put the drone up for a curious sight. The old Seaboard Yard office is finally getting demolished here after years of neglect and dilapidation. Ever since CSX built a brand new state-of-the-art facility right across the tracks here, the old building has sat empty and evidently now in April 2024, it's time for it to come down. It's definitely sad to see an old relic like this fall, but to see the new building and how it's almost three times the size of the predecessor is also a good sight. Another hour later and we'd be in Ybor City at one of Tampa's last old original seaboard signals. This is the approach signal to TN interlocking on the Clearwater sub at mile post SY844.3. It's an odd signal as it looks like at one point it did have three lights, presumably red, yellow, and green, which makes sense as it would have been the intermediate or holdout signal for TN back in the day. At its peak, the Clearwater sub was signal territory, at least between TN and the junction with the Brooksville sub at Sulphur Springs. Nowadays, the dispatcher-controlled lights at TN are the only ones left on the line, with the exception of this APP signal now being passed by daily local L755, heading north to Drew Park for the afternoon. Later in the evening, this local will bring back a few cuts of empty auto racks from Drew to be put on nightly train M442 to Waycross, dropping the auto racks in Baldwin. We wouldn't be out to see this as we'd start driving north back home to Lutz. Thanks to all who watched this one. I really do appreciate all the views and support. Everything and anything helps. But until we meet again somewhere out there trackside, this is Christian for Multicolor Films, end of transmission.